Yeah, so I'm, I'm super excited to be here. Uh, the Cosmic Micro background has been something that I've focused on since I like stumbled onto a class, basically my freshman year of college, my first quarter. And so it's, it's kind of been a major theme of my time in the US and my time here. And I'm excited to share a little bit of it with you all. Um, also, there hasn't been a CMB talk recently, so this is gonna be like really basic introductory stuff. I have like excellent colleagues who are gonna follow up and give you all the nice up-to-date stuff. So um, if, if this is like super familiar for you, it's always a good refresher. I hope you enjoy it. Um, and I hope I communicate a, a little bit about like the, the excitement and why studying the CMB drives us to go to some of the most remote places in the world. And so uh, this is a photo of Bicep 3, uh, which is a CMB telescope that's observing at the South Pole. And you can kind of see off to the side there, there is um, the building's called Maple. You have uh, where the bicep array experiment now lives. And some of the people in the audience work on that right now. And so um, kind of the key question that drives observational cosmology is uh, this really, really big question. And it's kind of surprising that we can make any progress in answering it at all, uh, which is can we come up with this like compelling, testable, theory of the universe at its largest scales, which it's, it's crazy that we can even think about the universe at its largest scales. And so uh, a key challenge is we can't go out and remake the universe. Um, and so we have to infer everything by observing what is already given to us and seeing as much as we can, we can learn from that. So there's a, a lot of this work kind of feels like archeology. span um, And this story really started with Einstein's general uh, theory of relativity. So as soon as he like formulated this incredibly beautiful theory, he was like, hey, can we apply this to the universe at its largest scales? And all of this really happened like basically in our neighborhood. So if you've been to Mount Wilson at any time recently, uh, you probably know that um, Hubble spent a lot of his time there making these really detailed observations of galaxies. And one of the things he saw is like, the farther away the galaxies were from us, the faster they seemed to be receding away from us. And so in general relativity, if you have a universe, you put stuff in it, you kind of have two things that can happen. It's either gonna expand or contract. Einstein really wanted it to just stay the same, which is one of the things he called his biggest mistakes. Um, and it turns out observationally, you find that actually the universe is expanding and it continues to expand at this like accelerated rate. And so that's like from Hubble's original paper and you can also see kind of a more updated diagram from data taken using the Hubble Space Telescope, uh, which is, like kind of a nice symmetry at the end there. Um, and this is one of the key, like if you think of cosmology as like, like a three-legged stool, this is like a primary leg on which all of our understanding of the universe rests on. Um, and the question is like, are there other earlier fossils that we can observe and interpret? And one of them is the abundance of light elements in the universe, a thing I'm not gonna touch at all, uh, but it's really interesting. Um, and the other is the afterglow from when the universe was hot and dense, and that's the cosmic micro background. And that's, that's basically the focus of this talk. And so it's, it's super interesting, if you ever wanna research this, the history of the discovery of the CMB is very cool because people had been seeing hints of it for like decades, and nobody knew what it was. So there's like tons of papers you can find out there where people are like, oh, there's this like weird two Kelvin noise in my data and I don't know where it comes from. And it's like a footnote in their paper and like that's, that's just it. Um, but there were two people, Arno Penzias and Robert Wilson, who they did kind of what all good scientists should do, which is if something bugs you, you keep like knocking at it until you find an answer. And so they had this weird anomaly in some of their horn antennas that they built for telecommunications um, at Bell Labs and they, they couldn't figure out where it came from they thought there were pigeons that were roosting up in there. They had like grad students go and chase them out. <laughs> Nothing changed. And so eventually they realized this thing came uh, from space because whenever they turned the, the telescope, it would just stay the same. Um, and actually the interpretation came from um, a guy's group called Robert Dickey and his gravity research group at Princeton. He was also working on another experiment to also make, make this very same measurement. And then he realized that someone else had already um, got it there before he did. Um, and so yeah, they're, they're kind of like three primary questions we ask ourselves when we think about the cosmic micro background. One is we, we ask how much power is there like as a function of frequency or wavelength? 
And so this like distinguishes it from all the other things we can see in the sky. There's like radio sources, there's all sorts of interesting things happening in the universe, and we'd like to be able to separate out what comes from the CMB versus what comes from like everything else. So that's one, one really fundamental question that's really hard to do. And that measurement is incredibly difficult to do because we have the atmosphere. And so um, a lot of the effort for measuring the CMB spectrum involves you either go to space or you send a balloon really high up so there's very little atmosphere above you or you shoot a rocket up into the sky so you can briefly break from the atmosphere and you could also try and do it from the ground but it's, it's actually really hard to do and so um, there were two groups that actually kind of got to the answer at roughly the same time so there was a Kobe mission which was um, at least there was a fire instrument was led by John Mather at Goddard um, and they measured the black body spectrum from a satellite really exquisitely. Um, this is like nine minutes of data that like produce this amazing plot. Um, and actually there was a competing experiment called COBRA. And so in the same year they both published, but COBRA lost out by a little bit and Mather's group kind of ended up getting the, the prize for that. And so there have been these like really incredible measurements of the CMB's thermal spectrum. Um, an incredibly hard measurement to do, and it actually reveals a ton about the universe. And so since then, Tons of different methods have been used to analyze this. Uh, so this is just a summary of the very different ways in which we've gone about doing this from the ground, from balloons, uh, from looking at emission lines in, of, of like cyanogen in, the, in, in like dust clouds in the, in the, in the galaxy, um, and all these methods. And so this is like incredible measurement that we know that the CMB has the temperature spectrum of a black body. It's a thermal spectrum, and you can define a really particular temperature to it. And this is like a really remarkable thing. And so we can learn a tremendous amount from this microwave sea of photons that we are bathing in. And actually the density of photons from the CMB is like 10 to the 10 orders of magnitude. You know, it's 10 to the 10 greater than the density of all the stuff that makes us up. And so the CMB is like incredibly abundant in the universe, uh, CMB photons. And so I think for me, the fundamental question that this answers is that Really, the physical state of the universe has been changing. And I think for a long time, everyone thought the universe might be steady state, like nothing interesting is happening. We just like kind of keep going. But like the CMB is like one of these very undeniable pieces of evidence that things have been changing. And especially because right now, as we see the universe, if you look at the frequencies at which the CMB peaks, it's in the, like the microwave frequencies, kind of like the microwave in your, in your kitchen. And the universe is very transparent in microwave frequencies. And so, if the universe is transparent in microwave frequencies and we see all this radiation coming in at those frequencies, then how did it get to thermal equilibrium? You need like lots of interaction to get everything to relax into like this really nice thermal equilibrium state. And so you really must have had like a period super early in the universe where everything was hot and dense and everything was in tight contact so that you could achieve thermal equilibrium. And this is like really just physics you can calculate out on, on a paper. Um, and so it turns out that the story we now tell of our universe, which has really been put in place by the CMB, is that there was this period where the universe was just completely ionized and opaque. The universe is permeated with all these protons and electrons. There is no neutral hydrogen anywhere. And the reason why there is no neutral hydrogen anywhere is because as soon as a proton and electron find each other, you make a neutral hydrogen atom, a super, an energetic photon comes, breaks the whole thing apart. And so your protons, your electrons, your photons, they're tied together in this like very dense plasma. And then you need the universe to keep expanding, and as the universe expands, it cools, the photons lose energy, and eventually you can form neutral hydrogen because your photons no longer have enough energy to ionize uh, your hydrogen. And so at that point, this happens really fast, so we are really just taking this snapshot, it's a baby picture of the universe, when the universe is around 300,000 years old, we're like 14 point something billion years old now, and so neutral hydrogen formed, and the CMB has been free to stream towards us since then. And I think the other really cool thing is that it tells us that the universe is kind of a nice place. It has been really tranquil. Nothing crazy has happened because if like crazy things happened, they would have completely disrupted this exquisite spectrum of the CMB that we measure. And so we are very close to homogeneous. Like we have, we are not homogeneous, right? I'm here, you're there, there's a table, there's a galaxy here, and there are planets. But like on the whole, the universe is very homogeneous. So the other question then we want to ask is what's the angular distribution of the CMB on the sky? 
And it turns out that CMB is incredibly uniform in all directions. And so uh, when Kobe went up into the sky and they made, they made these full sky measurements of the CMB, you can't do a full sky measurement from the ground. So for whatever measurements you do of the CMB on the ground, we always want to follow them up from, from space so that we can like make sure that it's the same in all directions. And so it's really precise in all directions with that like, very precise temperature, 2.7 uh, to 8 degrees Kelvin. But if you take away that like really uniform background, there's actually a little bit of like what we call a dipole signal. So there's one side that's hot, one side that's cold, and that's because we're moving relative to the CMB. So our solar system has a peculiar velocity relative to the CMB, and so that imprints. It's, it's basically a Doppler shift. You're imprinting a signal onto the CMB, and then if you take all of that away, what you're left with is this map of like really faint one part in you know one part in in five, in 10 to the five, signals of tiny fluctuation that you have. You have like stuff coming from your galaxy, but when you take all of that out, you see these like these tiny, slightly hot, slightly cold spots um, everywhere on the CMB. And so since then, Kobe was the first space mission that we had. It was followed up by WMAP in 2003. They made these even more precise measurements. And I think the last CMB space mission we had was Planck. Um, and in 2013, they measured the they measured both the temperature, and I'm going to talk a bit about polarization in a little bit. They measured it incredibly precisely. And so this is kind of a map of what the universe really looks like um, when you look at it under, under in, in, in the microwave um, regime. And so I, I, I had this analogy of the CMB is this sea of, of microwave photons. And so what, what can we learn from this? It turns out that the, these tiny hotspots and cold spots that we see on the CMB, they actually wait. So it really is like the universe is a giant bathtub and you have like waves sloshing around and you have just all these tiny fluctuations everywhere. And the way we understand what's going on is that there's two things that are happening. There's gravitational collapse. Things want to form, things want to collapse down to form stars. They want to collapse down to form galaxies. So gravity wants to collapse things down to form structure. But there's so much energy in the photons, it provides radiation pressure. And so this is like a spring effect. So you have something that's trying to crunch, something that's trying to spring back. What do you get? You get waves. And so these are waves that are propagating in the universe. So it's like bathtub. So the bathtub is sort of like ringing with these waves. And so you can ask, you know, based on what you know about your system, what are some of the most common wavelengths you're going to have? Like, is it going to be slightly stronger in some things? You know, you kind of something, I mean, you can see it in your bathtub. You like sloshing with some certain like frequencies. And so we really asked the exact same questions about uh, the CMB, and it actually turns out that it, you, you can make a lot of headway just by doing this. And so these, these tiny fluctuations we have, they really probe the underlying cosmology. And so if you look at an image like this, where you have a bunch of hot spots, which are in the kind of the orange, a bunch of cold spots in the blue, they're happening at like so many different scales. There's like big blotches, and there's like really, really, really tiny blotches. It turns out like one of the questions we can answer with this is if you say, hey, let me consider like the most, the strongest wavelength that I can see, the thing that seems to be really happening the most in this system, um, it actually sets up like a sort of like ruler on the sky. And so you can think about what the wavelength of that, sound, that acoustic wave is. And then we kind of know the distance to the CMB because we know the CMB was formed when the universe was at a certain temperature and we know it's cooled down to you know, 2.7 Kelvin, so we kind of know how far away the CMB is from us. And so we can really make a triangle like this. You can draw a triangle and you can measure an angle on the sky. And that angle, if you measure that angle to be somewhere close to one degree, it actually tells you something about the geometry of the universe. So if the universe has a flat geometry, then you get about one degree. If you have positive curvature, then that changes things. If you have negative curvature, that also changes things. And we, people actually went out, the Planck team went out and measured this, and actually you get precisely that the strongest peak in the signal that you see in fluctuations of the CMB is actually at around one degree, which tells us that the universe is really flat. And so, yeah, so if you look at these fluctuations um, as a function of angular scale, you see there's all these like really nice rhythmic ripples going up and down, up and down, up and down. And they decrease in size as you go to smaller and smaller angular sizes on sky. So it's kind of a weird plot. Small sizes on sky are towards the right. Big sizes on sky are towards the left. And so these this ripples you're seeing in the universe actually encode 
a ton of information about the underlying cosmology. And so if you have a model for what you think your universe is doing, you can fit it to what the spectrum of the CMB is, and it tells you something about the, your cosmology. And so the CMB is this really powerful probe that we have for constraining our cosmology. For us, one thing that's really interesting is that if you look at the really larger scales on the CMB, so you're looking at like basically 90 degrees on the sky, those, those fluctuations that are that big have barely been processed by all this physics that's happening with the waves. And so if you kind of want to understand what happened really close to the Big Bang, you want to look at the very largest scales on the sky. But it turns out the same problem that I mentioned where we can't go back and recreate the universe, it kind of comes back and haunts you, you can only divide the universe into large pieces in so many ways. And so you have like some error bars that you can never get rid of. And this is called cosmic variance. You can only break up the universe into so many pieces that are so large. And so we can actually never improve on this measurement just by taking uh, temperature fluctuation data. And so we need another probe in order to go deeper than this. And it turns out that the very same process that makes the CMB so uniform also generates a little bit of polarization. And so most people don't spend a lot of time thinking about polarization, but actually it's really familiar if you have some of those polarized sunglasses where you wear them, you go to the beach, it completely cuts off the glare uh, from the water. That's, that's exactly the same thing that's happening. Uh, but now it's happening at like a few percent level on the CMB. And so if you measure this really faint signal uh, from the CMB that's polarized, you can actually and you can actually derive data that comes all the way from a really early epoch in the universe that's called inflation. Um, I didn't want to take too much time to talk about it, so I'll, I'm not going to say too much more about it, but I wanted to show you some of the data from um, our experiment. So this is from Bicep Array. You kind of have what our temperature map looks like. So we are mapping, oh, sorry. Uh, we are mapping from the ground, and so you have, uh, we're just looking at a small patch of sky as compared to Planck that was looking across the whole sky. And so you have your temperature signal, and for polarization, you try and look into basically orthogonal directions, and so you have like vertical stripy things, and then you have like diagonal stripy things. I think that's like the best takeaways from <laughs> what, what you're supposed to see. And so, uh, really just to sum it all up together, it's amazing to me that by studying faint signals and looking at tiny deviations, we learn a tremendous amount of stuff about our universe. And all of this knowledge that we have, not just from the CMB, but from all these other probes, is now encapsulated in something that we call the Lambda CDM model um, that gives us this robust description of the universe. You just have a really basic recipe. You have dark energy, dark matter. You can ask all sorts of questions about that. You have the matter that makes us up. You have photons, you have neutrinos, and then you put all of this together in like the ratios that we have in the universe, and you go. And that's basically what we have. And so it's remarkable that we actually live in the age of what we call precision cosmology, where there's been lots of experimental efforts to measure some of the parameters that determine how our universe has evolved and is composed. Like we know some of those parameters to better than the percent level. And so it is remarkable that we can say um, all these profound things about um, our universe. And so really just wrapping it up, uh, I wanted to show you a photo of uh, the South Pole Station and where the experiments uh, that we are working on, especially at Caltech and JPL are. Uh, so this, this is the South Pole Station. I, I haven't been there in a long time, so these people who have vastly more recent information than I do. Uh, but you can see where Bicep 3 is now situated, where Bicep Array um, is, and actually BA4, so the, uh, one of our telescopes is going down there this season. Uh, and you can also see the South Pole Telescope, which I should have given them a shout out. Um, and that's where Bicep 3 is, and SPT, and Bicep Array is slightly off to the side. And so I'll end it with that, and happy to take any questions. Yeah.